experiences from a recorded talk. So we've come to develop samadhi. And so this word samadhi, what that means is the firm establishment of the mind. And so we have um, paid respects to the Buddha image already. We've taken up the five precepts. We've done our chanting, recollecting the good qualities of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. And now we have the opportunity to establish our mindfulness and to place this mindfulness on the breath, knowing the in-breath and knowing the out-breath. So this is the foundation for our mindfulness, for this recollection. So we can um, place our awareness at the tip of our nose. It's okay to do it there. And then know the in-breath, know the out-breath. And the purpose of this, the goal, is to establish our mindfulness at one point so that we don't be mindful or we don't go recollecting things in the past or things in the future. And what we're doing is we're training the mind to settle into peace, a temporary peace. Because what our minds normally do is that they think, they proliferate, and then this makes them very scattered and unsettled. But in order to understand the Dhamma, what we need is a peaceful, still mind. And so, in order to, to do that, we need to muster up the energy of our hearts. And we use uh, the breath to do that. We try to use our energy as well to stay with the breath, this in-breath, this out-breath, and use this as the foundation, as the main um, establishment of our mind. On the in-breath, we can recite Bud, and on the out-breath, Do. And so if we find it arduous or difficult uh, to be aware of the breath, then there's no need to establish the mindfulness with the breath. We can just use these meditation words instead, just recollecting the words Buddha Dhammo Sanko, Buddha Dhammo Sanko, Buddha Dhammo Sanko. And then when we carry on doing this, recollecting in this way, we can shorten it to just the one word of Buddha. There's no need to have awareness over the in-breath and the out-breath. We can just, well the point of this, the purpose of this, is to be keeping our minds with this mantra, with this meditation word of Buddha. So whether we are aware of the in-breath and the out-breath, or whether we are aware of just this word Buddha, this is for the point of bringing the mind to stillness. And both of these methods have this result. So as we carry on practicing, then the mind will lose interest over this meditation word of Buddha, and then it'll just be in a still and peaceful place. It will have come into samadhi. But it's also normal that at times it will lose its object and it will go off in thinking, proliferating. So we need to try to pull it back into peace to establish it in calm once again. Sometimes while we're meditating, the mind settles into peace and it can feel like the body is expanding. The hair on our body can stand on end, we can get goosebumps, maybe tears will start flowing. Or perhaps the body expands and it can feel like it fills up the whole Dharma hall. Or maybe it feels like it grows very tall and we may think that uh, we're going to break through the roof. But when we open up our eyes, then we see that it's not the case, that our body is just like it normally is. Or perhaps the body feels very compact, just like a rock, very heavy and firm. 
And so these are the different manif- manifestations of piti, of joy, and this shows that samadhi is arising. And so there's this knowledge over these different uh, manifestations, these different things that are happening to the body uh, through this feeling of joy. But we don't have much interest about that. We just bring our minds back to the objects of their recollection and carry on meditating. And when the mind has been still for a while, peaceful for a while, then it's normal that it will start to proliferate again. But we can contemplate at this point and contemplate uh, the nature of our lives of old age, sickness and death and see how these are normal things for us. That our minds attach to these bodies They attach to all physical and mental things. And they consider these to be me, to be a self. And when we have these kinds of attachments, then we'll have a desire that these bodies last forever, they live forever. We won't want for them to deteriorate in any way. But their nature is that when they're born and they grow up and they get older, and eventually they break apart, and this is just normal for these bodies. But we don't see it like that. That's not how we view things. And so the mind suffers. So we just want to get good things from this world. We gain things, but it's also natural to lose those things as well. We wish for praise, but there's also criticism. We want uh, for status, but there's also disrepute or loss of status. We wish to gain pleasure, but there's also pain. And so these worldly winds, these worldly dhammas, they come up when, whenever we exist in a world. And so we need to train our minds, we need to bring them to peace. And this is something that's very important. And so when the mind is brought into a peaceful state, um, then it's appropriate uh, for many different kinds of things. It's useful for many different kinds of things. So such as students studying at school, that they need this samadhi, they need peace, in order to be focused on what they're learning about, so their mind doesn't think and get distracted in different things. And it's also useful in our occupations as well, to be able to rest our hearts, to give them a break. Because while we're working, then the heart gets exhausted. And so if we can make our hearts come to rest in samadhi, uh, then this will give us a lot of benefit. So samadhi is very useful for many different kinds of things, for studying, for work. And it's also very useful for seeking out the truth as well. And so we've come to know about the very essence, the heart of the teachings of the Buddha. And this requires our training to do this, to cultivate this. And if we can do that from a very young age, this will give us a lot of benefit. So while we're sitting here, then we try to know the breath. Be aware of the in-breath, be aware of the out-breath. We can also use this mantra Buddha alongside that as well. And really try to keep the mind here with these objects. Whether we're standing, we're sitting, we're walking, lying down, then we can stay with this word of Buddha. And so sometimes maybe people will tell us that this is samatha, this is a calming method of meditation that we're developing. But we shouldn't argue with them. And sometimes people tell us that this is vipassana, and that we need vipassana. We need to know arising and ceasing. But we shouldn't argue with them either. We just understand that these other methods, the path um, that we use, 
and that we need to establish our mindfulness in order to develop, in order for wisdom to arise, in order for us to gain the understanding which allows us to put things down, to let things go. So when samatha, uh, the peace of heart, has reached a full level, then the Buddha had us contemplate into anicca, dukkha, anatta, into change in stress and not self, so that wisdom arises, so that we can gain a clarity of sight. But this requires uh, many qualities. This understanding relies upon our mindfulness. It relies upon samadhi. It relies upon wisdom. And these different qualities, they rely upon each other as well for their development. And all of this depends upon a foundation or virtue of sila. And sila is the mother and father of all dhammas. So if we want to practice the dhamma to a very high level, we need this quality of sila first. So the Buddha said that we should keep these five precepts as just a normal part of our lives. And we should practice in this way. Perhaps our minds won't stay with the meditation object and they're not very peaceful. So in that case, we can bring up a chant and think about that chant, recite it over and over and over again in our hearts. So we can bring up this chant of Itipiso, then Suvakato, Supatipano, the recollection of the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and chant this a lot. And then as we carry on doing that, we can reduce it down to just Itipiso. And eventually this comes down to just this one word of Buddha. And if the mind is still in peaceful, then it won't even want that. It won't want to think about this meditation word. And so we should just allow it to follow its nature at this point. Sometimes when we come out of samadhi, then the mind doesn't want to contemplate. It just feels very still. So we should know that the heart is like this at this point. There's no need to force it to contemplate. We just have mindfulness right there. So whatever we're doing, if we're working, then we have mindfulness with what it is that we're doing. When our minds, when we're meditating and the mind comes out of samadhi, then we can use that to contemplate, and contemplate into uh, the self. And so we may, sorry, that, that contemplation may happen all by itself. And so we may just be looking about, maybe in nature, and we gain understanding into truth. We see a leaf falling. We see that sometimes very new young leaves fall. Sometimes it's old leaves that fall. And so we bring that contemplation back into ourselves and contemplate how our lives are like this as well that our lives need to fall away too. Perhaps we go somewhere and we hear or see uh, someone who has died. And then we bring this back into ourselves, that I too will be like this. That the nature of my life, the nature of all conditioned phenomena is this way. So therefore, as yet, we haven't died. So we should try to build up a lot of goodness first and try to, but before we actually die. And so we can, while we have this breath, this in-breath and this out-breath, um, then we use this opportunity well. Because if we're heedless, then it's if, as if we're dead already. We've died within our minds. Because what we're doing in this life, it's not giving us any benefit. But if we have knowledge and we contemplate, then we can contemplate and understand death before we actually die. That we see the nature of the body is to be this way, that it does have to pass away. And then we get an understanding into this reality, that this is how things are. So we should contemplate everything that we gain. 
that all of these things need to break. They all need to fall apart. And we contemplate like this frequently, just carry on going through it until our minds accept. And then when this change happens, our minds will be able to accept that, will be able to understand that. But if we can't accept it, then when change occurs, there'll be a lot of suffering. Because it's just natural for things to be this way. Whether a Buddha arises in this world or not, this is how nature is. It's just like this, this tatata. It's just this way. It's not otherwise. That when there's a cause for something to arise, then that thing will arise. And so this is the nature of cause and effect. And so for the suffering, the dukkha that arises within us, um, we don't want that to come up. But the suffering, it doesn't just appear out of thin air. It has a cause for its arising. And what is that cause? It's this clinging and craving. This is what causes suffering. So we suffer because we have this attachment, because we have craving as well. And if we don't crave, then there's no way for suffering to arise. So say we get something material that we like, and there's this attraction that comes up, and then craving comes up as well. And we want for that thing to stay this way forever, to always be this way. And so if we're happy about something, then we always want to feel happy. We always want for that state to be there, for it to not be otherwise. And so there's feeling that arises and there's attachment to that, and this becomes the cause for suffering to come up. And so whether it's a material thing, whether it's these bodies of ours, then when they change, the heart will suffer. This dukkha arises. So we always need to be contemplating this, this nature of change and seeing it as being something that's completely normal. That all qualities have causes for their arising. And this is what the Buddha taught, that all dhammas, all phenomena, they have qualities uh, which makes them arise. And then there's there's also the cessation of those qualities as well. So this is what Venerable Asaji taught to Venerable Sariputta. And through hearing this, he gains the eye of the Dhamma. He saw how all Dhammas arise, stay for a short while, and cease. And they're not a being, they're not an individual, a self, or another. So if we suffer, it's because the causes of craving and attachment are there. And if we don't have any ignorance, craving, or attachment, then there won't be any suffering. This just can't arise. So none of us want to suffer in this world. Having been born, none of us want to experience stress or pain. But when the cause for suffering is there, then the suffering will come up. So the Buddha had us know what the suffering is like. He had us know that it's this way, that suffering is something that we should pay attention to, we should get to know. So it's not that we just desire for the suffering to go away and then it goes, but what we need to do is abandon its causes, and this cause is tanha, is craving. And how do we abandon this? We walk on this path of sila, samadhi, and panya, a virtue, collectedness, and wisdom. And this is what allows us to abandon craving, to experience nirodha. So whether a Buddha awakens to the Dhamma or not, then this is how nature is. The Dhamma element is this way. And the Buddha found this truth and he taught it to us. And this is a great fortune that we have. We've got a lot of merit to receive these teachings. The Buddha told us about this path, and having known it, then we should walk it. 
So in walking this path, what we do is we we use this path as a method to live our lives. And so as children, then we are students. And so we use these teachings to study. And then when we're working, we know our duties in work, that we do our work well, we fulfill our duties in a right way, and we look after our family. But in terms of the heart, then we need to find an inner refuge, a refuge for our hearts as well. Because external things, they're unreliable, they're not sure. And if all we do with our life is is seek out these external things, then we just waste our time, waste our time finding this wealth, and we don't use our time to cultivate our hearts. And so we waste it then. Even though we get a lot of money, we waste gold. We waste this golden opportunity that we've been given. Because the suffering or the happiness that we feel, this we feel this within our hearts, this arises within our hearts. And the reason why we want to gain things, we want to receive praise and status and pleasure, is for our hearts to be happy. But these things, they don't last forever. They need to change. And when they change, then the heart suffers. So we should come and train our minds so that they get an understanding of nature, of truth. So may all of you grow and develop in the Dhamma.